folks to this is the second in a series of four webinars that uh, we, the Ecosystem Work Group and the Council are um, hosting, uh, having to do with our um, the Council's newest initiative, the Climate uh, and Communities Initiative, which they decided to move forward with in September of last year. And uh, this second presentation, as you can see, you should be able to see on the screen, the title is The State of the Art for Ecological Forecasting at Short, Medium, and Long-Term Time Frames. We have four co-presenters listed here, um, Vera Trainer, Michael Jacox, Isaac Kaplan, and Samantha Sedelke, or Sedlecki, excuse me for mispronouncing your name. Also, uh, just a note there that Deb Wilson Vandenberg on the Ecosystem Work Group will uh, be uh, rap tour taking notes uh, during the webinar. A few sort of technical notes here, familiar to any of you who have been on previous webinars. Uh, members uh, of the public or those aside from the presenters and members of the work group have come on mute it. Um, and we do plan to have a, a question and answer period or opportunity for questions after the uh, presentation is completed. At that time, uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, uh, please use, there's a, a hand raise feature in the uh, GoToWebinar interface and you click on that and I should see a little hand and that will be the signal for uh, us to unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, if you have technical issues, uh, and uh, well, you'd have to have technical issues, but can see the screen <laughs> or something or hear me. But anyways, you can call Chris Kleinschmidt here in our office on our IT staff. There's the number listed there, 503-820-2411. Uh, we are recording this uh, presentation and also that will capture any chats. I doubt any will happen, but just so you're aware. Um, and we will be posting the recording to our website um, at, as soon as we are able to after this concludes. It usually takes a little while to process the recording and so on. And, um, and so don't expect it immediately, but uh, it, it's, uh, I guess we've claimed uh, within five business days and perhaps sooner than that. So that's really my overview. So we will turn the uh, uh, screen over to the presenters and um, they can get started. All right, and this is Isaac Kaplan just uh, doing a check to make sure the, web the webinar is working, WebEx is working. Looks good from our end. Much. So today we're going to talk about the state of the art for ecological forecasting at short, medium, and long-term time frames. Uh, this is Isaac Kaplan up in Seattle, and with me in the room is Vera Trainer, and then uh, Mike Jacox down in California, and Samantha Sedlecki, now at University of Connecticut, is also on the line. And so today we have a bit of a tag team. Uh, I'm going to start off and give some introductory material and talk about the forecasting toolbox. And then uh, we're going to switch chairs, and Vera is actually going to hop in and talk about uh, short-term forecasts related to harmful algal blooms, basically on the scale of uh, real-time predictions up to about a month. Uh, and then Mike Jacox and Samantha Sedlecki have prepared slides talking about seasonal forecasts uh, on the scale of 1 to 12 months, and then a bit touching on some medium-term forecasting work um, on the scale of a decade or two. And Mike is actually going to give those slides. And then at the end of our tag team performance here, um, I'll come back and talk a bit about long-term forecasts and uh, essentially climate scale projections and wrap things up. And so um, I just wanted to provide some, some introductory comments before we get into the details of the case studies that we'll talk about today. And so in particular, um, what you'll see throughout the presentation today is a, uh, a range of timescales uh, moving from 
on the left here the, the um, harmful algal bloom bulletins and re real-time observations, and that's what Vera is going to talk about again. Um, then we're going to talk uh, more about projections in terms of weeks to months and seasons. And for that, uh, Vera will also mention some live ocean forecasting that she's been involved with. Um, and then we'll talk a bit, um, Mike and Sam have prepared the slides about uh, the J-scope forecasts and ecocast. Um, and then towards the end of our, our time today, I will talk more about the Atlantis uh, ecosystem model projections and, uh, and a bit about ecocast and the climate scale work. And so I wanted to mention that um, uh, to, to some degree, we've worked out some of the technical aspects, especially, for instance, initial value problems related to the short-term forecasts, and then uh, these sort of long-term projections and dealing with long-term trends and scenarios related to the Atlantis work and the, the sort of century-scale projections. And um, as you'll see, uh, in particular, in Mike's presentation, the decadal-scale projections are are um, a bit more challenging, and he'll talk about why that is in some ways forward. And so this is the, the, the forecasting toolbox. These are the tools we'll talk about today, and then the, the range of timescales that we're going to address. And so I just wanted to make three main points, introductory points, uh, before we get into the case studies. The first point is really that uh, we know that any sort of forecasting work uh, going forward really needs to be tailored for particular clients. And I think the four of us presenting have discovered this in our work with forecasting. And we know that um, any sort of forecasts, whether it's daily forecasts or weekly or seasonal or longer term, any forecasts that the fishery council needs really need to be tailored to your decisions and your, uh, your needs. And so that's, that's definitely uh, on our minds as we uh, as we're talking about these case studies today. And what, what you see below is an example from Alistair Hobday in Australia. So that's from his 2016 paper where he actually worked very specifically with um, fishermen and also aquaculture producers to understand the time scales and the decision points of the stakeholders. And so this is the type of discussion and conversation that we hope to spark today. In particular, um, we know that you know, for, for this example in Australia, fishermen and aquaculture folks were thinking about um, decisions on, in terms of days, like what do I wear today, or how do I feed my, my aquaculture uh, facility, or um, how do I deal with extreme weather events that might be coming in the next few days. Uh, the same stakeholders talked about different sorts of decisions they make in terms of weekly to monthly planning, like quota purchase, or buying nets, or buying equipment or thinking about where they're going to land their fish uh, this trip or a few trips out. Um, and then, again, there's a sort of a different type of decision and a different time scale, thinking about decadal planning, you know, in particular building facilities, thinking about um, uh, maintaining and building processing facilities and, um, and uh, infrastructure like ports. And so as we move through th these case studies today, we're going to be thinking about those time scales. The second introductory point I wanted to make, uh, which will be a theme in all these presentations, is related to skill assessment. And so as you'll see today, model skill and validation and performance metrics are really a key part of each of these presentations. Um, and uh, the, the, the figure that you see on the bottom is a really good example of this. So uh, in particular, this is looking at the forecast skill, um, the, the one month ahead forecast skill for sea surface temperature. Um, the metric that we're looking at here, you can see on the bottom, is the anomaly correlation coefficient, which we'll come back to more later. But it's one of the standard uh, performance metrics that you'll see in this type of work. Um, so, so blue is better. And the, the good news here is that this particular type of forecast has some skill off our coast, off the California coast, so sort of uh, dark green and blue off our coast. Uh, so skill assessment is essential. The other thing that you can see in this figure is that um, ensembles of models are increasingly a part of these case studies and this sort of forecasting work. And so this picture is actually from the North American multi-model ensemble that we'll, Mike will talk more about shortly. Um, and uh, finally, I think that uh, this picture and a, a lot of the uh, work in the literature to date has really focused on model skill and performance metrics of some relatively simple uh, metrics of the, the physical structure of the ocean, 
uh, and, and, and things we can observe, so in particular sea surface temperature. But as we move forward and as we think about forecasting needs for the Fishery Council and other stakeholders, I think our experience has been that we start to focus in on very detailed and important um, aspects of ocean condition, and those might be, um, instead of sea surface temperature, it might be water temperature at the depths that Pacific hake live at, or it might be uh, summertime oxygen concentration on the Oregon shelf or the, uh, uh, the, the shelf in a special, uh, uh, in a particular area off, off, um, off the Washington coast. Uh, but really zeroing in on those, those particular skill metrics, I think, is going to be important. And the, the final introductory point I wanted to make is about uncertainty. You will see in our case studies a lot of emphasis on dealing with uncertainty. Um, some of you were on the webinar, the previous webinar in this series, and so you saw this figure. Um, and the point is that depending on the time scale of your forecasts and the time scale of your projections, the, um, the, the, the particular driver or the particular source of uncertainty varies. And so, for instance, if you're looking at a projection uh, from the late 2000s forward just a few years, most of that uncertainty is coming to coming from stemming from internal variability um, in the model in the models themselves and in terms of the spread within the models in a model ensemble. And um, and so you'll see some of that in the ensemble work that we talk about, particularly at the seasonal forecasting. And then in the longer term projections, so for instance, the ecosystem model projections out decades or centuries, uh, we're really looking at lots of scenarios and scenario development uh, to think about um, how the biology might respond and how, for instance, scenarios of CO2 emissions uh, might uh, trend in the future. Um, and finally, one way of dealing with that uncertainty and one way of uh, sort of improving the, the model skill and narrowing the uncertainty is via downscaling. And so in particular, we can look at the figure here um, where there's a global climate model, which is at relatively coarse resolution, and we can downscale that uh, uh, via a regional ocean modeling system to get to much higher resolution uh, processes at the scale that is most relevant to our, typically to our, our fishery species. Okay, and with that, um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Vera Trainer, who's going to talk about short-term forecasts. So good afternoon, everyone. I will be giving an example of the harmful algal bloom forecast. And as you hear this talk, I would like you to think expansively about harmful algal blooms as an indicator of ecosystem stress. The very fact that these algae are blooming and a single species is present in the water at such, such a high abundance is an indicator of ecosystem imbalance. So we know that in July 2014, and even prior to that, we had huge temperature anomalies in the Northeast Pacific fondly known of as the blob. And these temperature uh, anomalies were sustained until well into uh, 2016. The large harmful algal bloom, though, hit the coast in May of 2015 and had quite extensive impacts on fisheries. We know that the blob was joined by El Nino, and those impacts were seen in the, in the uh, Western U US, primarily in California. So here are some of the impacts of the particular harmful algal bloom species called Pseudonychia. It is a diatom that is very commonly found in our coastal waters. What we know as a result of this harmful algal bloom is that we had huge impacts on the Dungeness crab fishery, quite extensive losses, over $100 million lost to the harvest in 2015. And then also razor clam harvests suffered great losses, including subsistence, tribal fisheries, commercial and recreational harvests. But in addition, we had a number of marine mammal strandings and deaths, which you see on the right hand side here. These were only the animals that were found stranded. We we believe that the impacts were quite a lot greater than we were able to quantify. Wherever you see a symbol of an animal in red was a confirmed death 
of a marine mammal, and those in yellow were those mammals that had some concentrations of domoic acid in their flesh and were found to have uh, the health was impacted in these particular organisms. In addition, every single sardine and anchovy that was collected on the fisheries cruises contained at least some quantities of domoic acid and record levels were found in others. So you can see the impacts were quite large to the entire U.S. West Coast ecosystem. So what are we doing about this? What elements are going into our early warning system, fondly known as the Pacific Northwest HAB Bulletin or HAB Forecast. Well, we know from past studies that we have two initiation sites, the Juan de Fuca Eddy and Hecate Bank, shown here in yellow, that are source regions for these harmful algal blooms. And in combination with winds, currents, and other transport factors, these blooms from the initiation site can be brought to the coast. The Columbia River plume plays an important role because it can either be a conduit for these blooms or a barrier. So you see on the left-hand side that we have a number of elements that go into the, into the bulletin, into the short-term forecast, which includes toxin and cell monitoring at the coast, through programs in Washington and Oregon, offshore boat sampling at hotspot sites, weather predictions, models, which I'll get into a little bit more in detail, climate change indicators. And what this allows us to do is selectively harvest at safe locations or even preemptively increase harvest limits. In 1991, when the first domoic acid outbreaks occurred, there were commonly blanket closures, that is coastwide closures of the entire fishery without any opportunities for selective harvests. So the foundation of the forecast is a monitoring program on the, on the west coast in Washington state, which is now sustained through a tax on the shellfish license fees. This is called the ORHAB program. In Oregon, there is a similar program that allows us then to basically assess the skill of our models that tell us whether or not these blooms are in fact uh, reaching the coast where they're impacting the coastal shelf fisheries. So these programs sample at least once a week and when there are blooms, they're able to increase their sampling to uh, more frequently. In addition, we have an environmental sample processor, which has, it's basically a robot um, that's in a, a trash can size um, uh, container that's placed on the Chaba mooring, which is close to La Push, Washington. This is placed seasonally at a site, which we know is in the pathway of the cells being transported from the coastal hotspot sites. This robot can basically phone home and give us information on whether the harmful algal species are present or the toxins are present. So these are two elements of the forecast that basically illustrate that we're going from robots to people to collect a variety of data that give us the most, uh, the, the greatest amount of information. So now moving on to the live ocean model, which is basically giving us information from rivers, from tides, from ocean fields and atmospheric fields that are all being put together to give us information about transport and, and landing of these harmful algal blooms from the hotspot sites to the coast. And I'll show you an example here. You can actually see a movie of a live ocean forecast. This is in October 2017, when we anticipated that there might be transport from the hotspot sites to the coast. And what you can see is that indeed cells did arrive at the coast of Oregon, but not along the coast of Washington. They actually went north to our Canadian partners. So this kind of fine-tuned model is very, valuable to us to know which selective beaches can be open and where we should provide a, a, the greatest warning for the HABs to hit the coast. 
So this is basically showing one aspect of the skill assessment of the live ocean model. What you see in the center is the Sudanicha cells that have arrived at Long Beach, Washington, which is the southern beach here in Washington, just north of the Columbia River. Then the top panel shows you live ocean outputs show uh, particles released from the Juan de Fuca eddy. And then this southern, this sorry, southern, this bottom panel is showing us whether cells from Hecate Bank are making their way also to the Long Beach site. So you can see uh, two out of the three events had Hecate Bank as their site of origin, whereas this fall event in September and October had its source region as the Juan de Fuca eddy. In addition, we have data from moorings that are also able to give us further information about the skill of the model. So here is an example, and it's, it's quite wordy, but these are the tailored forecasts that are the result of numerous discussions with coastal managers. And some of the feedback that they've provided to us is that they would like to have an explanatory key. So you can see here this example from August 2017, the HAB risk was yellow. This is using a traffic light pattern. So there was a moderate risk of HABs reaching the coastal shellfish at this particular uh, time of year. Um, they also wish to have more information about long-term forecasts, and that allows them to increase their, st their staffing and, have, and take other actions based on the anticipated um, HABs for, say, the year. Um, the new features of the forecast are live ocean model, as I showed you. Uh, we're also collecting samples at offshore hotspot sites. We've collaborated with the Macaw Tribe, who are now able to send vessels out to the Juan de Fuca Eddy to collect samples, and they're analyzing these samples in their lab. The environmental sample processor is now available seasonally, and we have a series of ocean indices that also can be used. We're working with a company also to possibly deploy gliders during times when the ships cannot collect samples at the hotspot sites. So just briefly about seasonal forecasts, we're working toward using our data set that we have for now at least a couple of decades to look at long-term signals of these HABs. And what you can see here is on the bottom panel, the shellfish closures in Oregon which seem to be very clo closely related to warm water events, whether those are El Nino or blob events. So we're using this information to provide long-term forecasts of these Sudanicha blooms. So that is work in progress. So the key messages here for the short-term forecasts are that these blooms do signal environmental stress. There are situations, especially in 2015 where we've seen such massive blooms and such massive impacts on the fisheries that we know these cells are resilient. We know they're indicating stress. We know that we need to tailor our forecasts, as Isaac mentioned, to enable specific management decisions surrounding the clam harvest, the crab harvest. We've even been working with some of the mammal, mammal entanglement people. Um, model skill is, is assessed using mooring and monitoring data, and the short-term bloom conditions will inform our long-term projections. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike to talk about the seasonal ocean forecast. Okay, just getting my screen up here. Okay, so you should be able to see um, full screen again now. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about sort of the next uh, couple of scales of forecasting, largely what we call seasonal ocean forecasts, which is typically on the scale of one to 12 months, and then a little bit on medium term forecasts um, should be more, uh, yeah, like one or two out to 10 or 20 years. 
So just to give you an idea of what's available already, um, this is just a screenshot of a web page for the North American Multimodal Ensemble. And this is hosted by NOAA, but it's a collection of climate modeling centers that collaborated to put their output in a similar format and, and make it available in one place. And these are seasonal forecasts um, for global models. So uh, global climate models that are typically resolving the surface of the Earth on the scale of 100 kilometers or something like that. Same ones that we talked about uh, last week for climate forecasts. And in this case, they just configure them slightly different so that rather than looking at long-term trends, they're trying to nail the state of the um, ocean and atmospheres over the next year. So you can get data, um, something like this is something that would be commonly looked at. So this is a forecast of a, an ENSO index. So if you're looking for coming El Ninos or La Ninas, this is, I guess, was, act, was the latest a day ago anyway. It's the January forecast of uh, and so conditions for the next few months. And so the black line is the observations. And then starting from December, you have these forecasts from all these different models of what's likely to happen. And the dotted black line is the mean of all of those. So this is this idea of ensembles that uh, Isaac touched on, and I'll talk a little bit more about, but you've got, in this case, sort of the same qualitative expectation from these different models, but with different strengths of a recovery to neutral conditions or even a swing in slightly warm conditions. So that's, a, uh, you know, those are forecasts for a specific region. Um, alternatively, you could look at maps where you pick a time that you're looking at a forecast for. So now these are forecasts of what, it, what temperature anomalies are going to look like in spring. So how much the sea surface temperature is going to be different from the average. And the first, well, all of the panels except for the bottom right are different climate models. And you can see that, you know, structurally they're pretty similar. But also if you look, for example, at the Southern Ocean, at the very bottom of the panel in the, in some of these models are quite different. Uh, the NSEP model in the top left shows a very warm Southern Ocean in the spring. The uh, NASA model that's on the bottom row, third from left, shows a very cold Southern Ocean. And then on the bottom right is the, is the multi-model ensemble, so the mean of all those forecasts. So these are out there. Anyone can go look at these forecasts for the coming months and look at whatever region they're interested in. And of course, if we're gonna use this, we wanna know uh, if they're any good, right? So um, a common metric for that is looking at correlations. And, and the way we can do that is by looking back at on the order of 30 years of these forecasts and seeing how they did. So if you just look at the top panel there, for each year, we've got a forecast that was made in January, and it was forecasting what the temperature anomaly would be in August. So you've got one forecast for year, per year for 30 something years. And you put those all together and those are in blue and compare them to what we actually saw in the observations, which were in black. And what you can see is that there's not a whole lot of correspondence between those two time series and the correlation coefficient or that R value on the bottom right there is 0 0.3. So that can go from zero to one and 0 0.3 is not particularly strong. In contrast, the bottom panel there is the same thing, but for forecasts that were made in August, predicting the March sea surface temperature. Um, and I should have said this is now looking specifically for the California current. So in this case, the forecasts tend to be actually quite good. There's a lot of skill there. That correlation coefficient is up around 0.7. And then we can take those kind of skill assessments and look at them across a whole bunch of models and a whole bunch of um, sort of forecasting situations and summarize them. And I'll, I'll walk you through that. So in this uh, figure, what you're seeing is along the y-axis is that correlation coefficient. So you can basically think of that as skill, just forecast skill. And then along the horizontal axis is the lead time or how far in advance are you trying to predict the sea surface temperature? 
and the individual lines, the thin lines are skill for different individual models. The thick black line is the skill for the ensemble mean, so the mean of all those models. And then that dashed black line is the skill of a persistence forecast. And a persistence forecast is basically just saying things will stay how they are. Um, so if it is anomalously warm today in January, I'm going to guess that it's still going to be anomalously warm in March or April or May. And there's actually a fair amount of skill in a forecast like that because the ocean evolves relatively slowly, say, compared to the atmosphere. So a couple of just things I want to point out here are you can see spread in the skill of these different models. Um, interestingly, the, the ensemble skill tends to be as good as or better than the best model. So even though that ensemble is taking information from models that don't individually perform as well as the best model, using the information from those models is still useful in getting more skill out of an ensemble. Um, and the other is that, again, this persistence forecast can yield a fair amount of skill, and that doesn't require running any model. That just requires looking at the current conditions. So just to sort of quantify what these numbers actually mean, can put some, some bars on here. So zero means you have no skill, okay? You might as well just not look outside and guess what's going to happen uh, for your forecast. And one is perfect skill. At about 0.35 or so in this case, you have significant skill. So you can be confident that you are doing better than chance. And at about 0.5, or, and so that's like a 95% confidence. Highly significant is a 99% confidence. So even though in some cases it looks like the models might not do that much better than this persistence forecast, if you pick, say, that highly significant skill, the persistence forecast will give you that out to about two months, whereas this model ensemble will get you out to five months. So it actually, there's a lot of added value there in these models. All right, so then we wanna know where that comes from. And again, one, one source is persistence. Things, things as they are now will tend to have some inertia. Um, another one is illustrated by this series of plots. So if you walk through from the left to right, on the far left is um, anomalies in the wind, and all this red basically means that the wind is anomalously northward. And what that translates to in the second plot is that the upwelling is anomalously weak, and subsequently the sea surface temperature is anomalously warm. And this last plot um, is a subsurface metric, but you can think of it as, say, a proxy for nutrient supply. Um, red being sort of less availability of nutrients, which would tend to lead to a less productive ecosystem. So then you've got this, these global models are getting some skill and sort of capturing some of these patterns. But again, we've touched on this a few times. If you look at this in a more resolved way, you see that while things are qualitatively the same, the signals are, are really too diffuse in the global models and there's important stuff happening on finer scales. So we want to try to resolve that, and that's what I'll get into next with a couple of examples. So the first being JSCOPE, um, which is Jizeo's Seasonal Coastal Ocean Prediction of the Ecosystem. And the basic idea here is that you take output from one of these global models on the left. In this case, it's the climate forecast system, which has a resolution on the order of 100 kilometers. And you use it to, to run, to provide information to run a very fine resolution model of a small region, this time or here off the Pacific Northwest. And so here's an ocean model with 1.5 kilometer horizontal resolution. So you can get a lot more of the important dynamics. And it contains all the physics and biogeochemistry. So things like temperature and salinity, but also nutrients, chlorophyll, and even things like oxygen and pH. And then you can use output from that ocean model to look at changes in habitat of things like sardine um, or hake or crab. So what these forecasts actually look like now, you can see these movies 
where uh, moving through time here on the bottom panel, you can see where we are in the year of 2017 and the upwelling is changing. And then you can see this evolution as well in some of the parameters that are of particular interest, oxygen, temperature, pH, and then omega is uh, the saturation state for aragonite. So this is an important parameter for things that are sensitive to um, ocean acidification, like things that form shells in particular. So this is kind of a product, and this is quite a, in a young field, this is a very mature product, I would say. Um, and Sam Sudlecki, who's on the line, um, can speak to, to this in detail. So again, skill assessment and validation of these forecasts is a key goal, and that's been done a few ways in this case. So this is, uh, again, looking at correlation coefficients for a few different variables from forecasts over multiple years. Um, interestingly, the, the bottom values, so, so uh, parameters over the shelf, there's been more luck in finding skill for those, uh, things like temperature and oxygen, uh, which is good news for predicting changes, potential changes in benthic communities. Um, also, comparing forecasts to in-the-water assets, so in this case, uh, the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary has moorings, and there are data streams from those, which are served through um, the net, well, what is it, the Northwest Alliance for Networked Ocean Observing Systems, I believe, NANUS. So in this case, you can go, you can see the observations from this public portal. You can also see the forecasts and compare the two um, and so the forecast are the two shades of blue there and the red is the observations and so the public or stakeholders can go and see see both and this is an important way of i think building trust in these forecasts and seeing that there is value in them there's also been validation from shipboard surveys so in 2016 there was this comprehensive coastwide survey um, focused on ocean acidification, and this is again that aragonite saturation variable um, and qualitatively good agreement. There's some differences in sort of cross shore gradients and things, um, but the model is getting a lot of the structure correct. And then lastly, again, this idea of an ensemble. So just like you can do it for global models, you can run multiple uh, iterations of the regional model. And here, this is just a metric of how different the models are. So more blue means there's more difference between um, multiple models and more uncertainty in the forecast. So that's one example of a seasonal forecasting product that has uh, these ecosystem applications. Uh, another one is one that uh, we call EcoCast that's targeted at the California Drift Gillnet Fishery, and it's meant to deal with bycatch issues. So this is a fishery that targets swordfish, but has historically had um, problems with bycatch of, of turtles and other animals. And so uh, it's heavily regulated and there are closures, um, which are sort of summarized in this map on the right that are enacted uh, various times of the year. And so the idea is just, you know, can you do this in a more informed and dynamic way? And the approach is to take um, oceanographic data, which are in the middle left there, a couple examples, and combine that with the data that we have on where and when these species uh, are present. So that can be either observer data from the fishery, or in some cases we have tracking data where animals have been tagged and we can see where they go. And you combine all these models uh, combine all this data into species distribution models, where you basically uh, try to define the preferred habitats for different species so that when you have just the environmental data, you can predict where the species are most likely to be. And then in this case, the idea is to take those species distribution models for multiple species of interest to the fishery, both the target and the bycatch species, and combine them based on which ones you care most about into a single product that basically says you know where is better to fish in the blues and where is worse to fish in the red and so what we're working this is this is also pretty well developed um, 
And so now what we're working towards is moving it to a seasonal forecasting framework, where now we take those global forecasts, use them to run the regional model, and then use those to, to forecast the species distributions. With the hope that what's on the right allows you to um, implement closures in, in time and space in a, uh, you know, a more dynamic and hopefully more informed or effective way than uh, the static approaches. All right, so some key messages from this section. Uh, basically, the opportunities and benefits are, I think, in fisheries are what I was just saying, which is that we have some predictability on these seasonal scales, and there's potential to inform fisheries management based on that. And we know that there is some predictability in the climate system on those scales, and so we want to exploit that towards those ends. And uh, lessons that have been learned, especially from folks in Australia that Isaac mentioned earlier, but also along the West Coast, is how key it is to engage stakeholders early on in this process to find out what products are actually beneficial. Um, on the technical side, you know, in the atmosphere, this kind of forecasting is, has been around a lot longer, and we're leveraging the expertise from there, um, using multiple models uh, to try to reduce the uncertainty and, and assessing the skill, and also just trying to see where this predictability comes from uh, so that we can know when we can expect things to be predictable and when they might be less predictable. All right, now just quickly, I'm gonna move into medium term forecasts. And the first thing I'll say is that this is a, a predictability gap. So it's between this seasonal scale where you can get some persistence and you can get some predictable evolution of things like El Niños and La Niñas, but it's not far enough in the future where you get the emergence of these anthropogenically forced trends and things like that. It's kind of in the, in the noise part of the signal to noise spectrum. Um, but there is hope, and I'll just illustrate that with a couple slides here. So this is one illustrative idea, and um, there, are, there are large scale currents in the oceans. So there's a North Pacific gyre, and the northern part of that is a North Pacific current that um, flows across from near Japan over to near the US-Canada border indicated by these black arrows. And so if you have some anomalous ocean conditions in the subsurface, there's potential that they can be transported across the ocean. And this transport across the Pacific Ocean here takes a long time, takes, takes years. So we might be able to get some predictability out of that. Um, so for example here, if you look at the area where the yellow box is, Look at the salinity somewhere in the subsurface, and then there's a time series of that on the bottom right. And then look off of our coast at the salinity 10 years later. The idea is that you're now seeing 10 years later that signal that was observed out in the open ocean um, prior. And there's uh, you know, some correlation between these time series and some hope for this, uh, but it's definitely a uh, area of development. Um, a uh, relatively immature of the forecasting time frame. All right, so now I'm going to pass it back to Isaac to talk about long term. All right, and this is Isaac Kaplan, and we're just Switching slides here, and I'll just check with Mike and make sure you can see my slides now, Mike. Yep. Okay. So yes, I'm going to talk about long-term forecasts, and in particular, um, forecasts that start at a couple decades and project uh, forward, thinking about climate change and global change. Um, this work is, uh, what I'll present today is related to ocean acidification impacts in the California current. And as many of you know, ocean acidification has been called the evil twin of global warming. It also stems from global emissions of carbon dioxide. Um, and as that carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean, we see the consumption of carbonate ions. Um, and calcification in particular is impeded. 
as Mike mentioned before, that's essentially bad news for shell-forming organisms, so bivalves and, and uh, potentially some mollusks. Um, but also, it may have additional impacts on non-shell-forming organisms, including fish. Um, the work I'll talk about today is uh, was really looking at uh, three components uh, and trying to understand how these changes in pH, so a decrease in pH or ocean acidification, what that means for the California current food web and fisheries. The three components of this project were an oceanographic model, a literature review, and ecosystem model projections. And the oceanographic model, um, essentially um, similar to the previous discussion, it downscaled from global models to uh, regional ocean modeling systems, looking at the difference between 2060s versus 2010s ocean conditions, including pH. Um, the second part of this was a very extensive literature review of over 300 studies. And this was conducted by Shallon Bush and Paul McElhaney, uh, looking at the relative sensitivity of species and groups in the California current to declines in pH. And so essentially this was part of that scenario building, um, but it was related to the scenarios for the biological response to global change, or to ocean acidification. And then we took these two parts of the story and combined them and used them to force an Atlantis ecosystem model. And that's essentially ecosystem model projections, looking at how those changes in biogeochemistry influence uh, the simulated California current food web um, and how that feeds through to the human part of the uh, system, including fisheries catch uh, and revenue per port. And so the three main questions that we asked here were, first of all, um, in particular from this, this literature review, um, what are the organisms that we think are most at risk or most sensitive to declines in pH? Secondly, when we play that through the ecosystem model, what are the impacts on the rest of the food web and on, on predators in particular? And finally, what does this mean in terms of fisheries revenue? And so I just, again, with the theme of downscaling, um, this work, uh, so the, the regional ocean modeling system, so the high resolution oceanography, was driven by a uh, NOAA GFDL Earth system model. And the coarse resolution of that model is shown here. Um, but it illustrates the sort of uh, forcing effects, these long-term trends that are driving the ecosystem. And in particular, you can see pH in surface waters in August on the left um, for 2013 and on the right for 2063 under the um, IPCC RCP 8.5 scenario. So essentially that's business as usual, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and you can see essentially a, uh, about a 0.2 or a 0.3 drop in pH. So a, so a real increase in ocean acidification uh, for our region. And of course the California current as an upwelling system is particularly prone to these bouts of low pH and ocean acidification. So this is the global forcing, which uh, we then downscaled, again, using a, a regional ocean modeling system. And I'll show you sort of three take-home messages from this, three results slides. Uh, this slide shows us the biomass response uh, of species and groups uh, to 2060's pH, so to that sensitivity and pH. So that biomass response is shown on the y-axis. And then individual species are aggregated into guilds on the x-axis, which is, uh, for instance, the mammal guild or the seabird guild or the shark guild. And so you can see typically that pH effect is negative, meaning that there are negative impacts on biomass, biomass declines due to these drops in pH. Um, the responses of individual species or groups are shown in open circles. And then the average response per guild is shown as the solid circle. And as I mentioned before, part of this work was really developing those scenarios for biological sensitivity to ocean acidification. So each of the five different colors here is a different scenario for that response. Uh, but for brevity here, we'll just focus on the black bars, which are the, the sort of cumulative response. Uh, and so the, the take home messages here are that we have direct effects in particular on filter feeders um, and this epibenthos group, uh, which includes crabs. And those are forced on the model. That's basically something we learned directly from the, the meta-analysis of the experimental laboratory results. Um, but we also see indirect effects, so declines in particular on some of the species in the shark guild and some of the demersal fish. And of course, those are feeding on a lot of the, the bottom-dwelling invertebrates. And so it's a, a sort of a predator-prey or food web effect that's trickling through here. 
And then I also wanted to mention uh, one thing we learned in this study is that Dungeness crab, although they're likely somewhat directly sensitive to ocean acidification, we also found that they're, um, they're also suffering indirect effects as that food web is eroded. And so they also sort of face this double whammy of a change in their food base and then also uh, 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 direct effects due to declining pH. And so just to put this in the context of uh, fishery management plans, um, this is the, the catch response or also the biomass response. Again, this is the same metric as before, looking at declines due to sensitivity to that 2060s pH. Um, and here, the x-axis is just giving you some sense of the scale of revenue, so baseline revenue in 2013. Um, and individual species are represented here as open circles. Um, but then uh, Kristen Marshall, the lead author here, aggregated the results into um, fishery management plans. And so species, the green species here, are aggregated into the solid green CPS, coastal pelagic species, fishery management plan. Uh, Hake stands by itself. All of the open circles here um, in blue are the uh, solid ground fish dot. Um, and then you have state managed fisheries, so sort of outside the council purview. Um, but the state managed fisheries include Dungeness crab, and those are shown here in the orange, aggregated into the orange solid dot. The main point is that we see some, if you think about risk from, from sort of a portfolio perspective or from the perspective of the fishery council's management portfolio, these model projections suggest that some species like coastal pelagic species and hake um, are uh, less at risk or less vulnerable to these uh, projected pH effects. Groundfish are, are somewhat more vulnerable to this uh, change in the food web in particular. And then the state managed fisheries, in particular the crab fishery, um, is, is, is also moderately vulnerable but also uh, highly valuable. So that really stood out in this analysis. Finally, uh, we can look at the economic response to those changes in fishery revenue at the port level. And so those results that we just showed um, can also be translated into revenue uh, for particular port regions or port groups. And so here, declines in revenue are shown um, on the left in terms of red or dark orange colors. And then we can also translate that via input-output models to income in the broader economy and jobs on the right. And so the point here is that even though we saw some biological effects of ocean acidification in the south on particular species, the main economic driver was really that decline in Dungeness crab abundance and revenue. And that drives large declines in uh, these economic indicators or economic performance of the northern ports in particular, because they are particularly, particularly reliant on Dungeness crab. Okay. and. Um, so skill assessment has been mentioned uh, previously. Um, skill assessment is particularly hard for this type of sort of large, slow-running ecosystem model projection. Uh, but we have done quite a bit of work along these lines, um, but it's, it's ongoing. And so one of, the, one of the places we tackled that type of skill assessment and validation was in a fishery council review, a methodology review that we had two years ago, um, yeah, following the methodology review process with input from the Council SSC and some external reviewers as well. And a lot of this involved qualitative comparisons of model projections uh, to uh, either stock assessments or survey data. And I just wanted to mention that this is definitely the, the sort of cutting edge of how to apply and how to validate these models. And there are certainly steps forward, and I just wanted to point to one paper by uh, Eric Olson and some folks uh, also from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center who have started to develop and, and apply uh, skill metrics actually from the biogeochemical literature to uh, apply those skill metrics to this type of ecosystem model projection and really quantify skill um, uh, in terms of modeling efficiency and root, root mean squared error and a standardized set of, of skill metrics. Okay, so just to summarize uh, these Atlantis projections related to ocean acidification, again, from the, the sort of literature review, the meta-analysis of experimental results, we know there are likely to be strong ocean acidification impacts on invertebrates especially. We also expect some indirect effects, as we learned from the food web projections, on crab and demersal fish and sharks. 
Um, some of the uh, fishery management plans might be more vulnerable than others. So, for instance, uh, state managed fisheries were uh, appeared to be most vulnerable, while coastal pelagic species appeared to be much less vulnerable. Northern ports uh, were projected to see the largest declines in revenue, income, and jobs. And again, um, this type of work really relies on those long-term scenarios, uh, both scenarios for uh, global climate and emissions, and then also scenarios for biological response. And I also wanted to point you to the actually the fourth uh, webinar in this series, where we start to think about uh, fleet dynamics and fisher response to a changing climate. Um, and then also, of course, skill assessment is ongoing. Uh, we're making strides in that direction, but it's it's a, sort of a core part of this work. Okay, and then um, before I uh, leave this section of the talk, I just wanted to mention that the ocean acidification projections that I just talked about are, are sort of uh, winding down, but there's a new project I wanted to put on your radar, which is called From Physics to Fisheries. And this is the work of Mike Jaycox and Desiree Tomasi and others. Um, and this is, um, again, using global climate models and downscaling those via regional ocean modeling systems. Uh, using those to link into ecosystem models related to sardine, albacore, and swordfish, um, and then testing impacts via management strategy evaluation, and finally feeding that through to socioeconomic analyses. And um, this is a new project. It's just starting, but I wanted to put it on your radar uh, in particular as you think about the next uh, year or two of this climate initiative. So I'm just going to conclude with a, a couple take-home messages here. We're entering an era of rapid ocean change, and all of these forecasts really help us think about what we expect to see on the horizon, either days out or weeks out or even um, decades ahead. I like to think about this personally in terms of uh, decision-making. Uh, so in particular, short-term forecasts, like Vera mentioned about should I harvest crab or shellfish next week or in the coming days. Uh, seasonal forecasts, like the Jake, the uh, J-Scope and the EcoCast work, thinking about particular species like, will the summertime hake migration actually um, uh, take the hake all the way to Canada? Will the ocean conditions be amenable to that? Um, will uh, shelf hypoxia off Oregon in the summer affect Dungeness crab? Or spatially, and uh, what will the bycatch risk be for turtles in the drift gillnet fishery? Um, and finally, in, in particular, thinking about decisions on this sort of decadal or climate scale uh, time scale. Uh, I think the questions there are really, what are the risks, what are the global change risks to particular ports and fisheries and components of the California current ecosystem? Um, as Mike mentioned, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of promise in terms of those midterm forecasts, but this is uh, still somewhat of a predictability gap. And I think we just need to be clear about that, not to overpromise promise uh, to, to you all in the context of this initiative. Um, and then the next steps for all of these projects are really to think about how we can tailor forecasts for the Fishery Council and for other stakeholders that we're working with. Secondly, to continue pushing forward on skill assessment. And uh, finally, to keep these, uh, these aspects going involving scenarios, uh, so in particular, uh, climate scenarios and fisher response scenarios in the physics to fisheries project, and then also uh, continuing to develop um, and apply ensembles of, of forcings like the NMME uh, that Mike talked about, which is being used both for EcoCast and JScope. Okay, with that, I realize we're at uh, about an hour, and I want to open it up for questions, and I think. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, I just wanted to pose a couple of questions for you, for you all. Um, the first is, uh, what ocean conditions matter most for your fisheries and species? And so is it sea surface temperature, or is it oxygen, or is it pH, or um, what, what aspects of the ocean do you actually need to have some, some forecast skill for? And then secondly, in general, what do the Fishery Council needs, uh, whether it's on a short-term forecast, or a seasonal forecast, or a long-term basis? And uh, with that, I just want to thank a lot of uh, collaborators, and I think we can open it up for questions. And I'll pass it back to Kit to handle that. Thank you, Isaac. And I think I will in turn um, 
following what we did in the last webinar, turn it over to Yvonne Duranier, who's the chair of the Ecosystem Work Group, and have her moderate uh, discussion uh, and questions. Great. Thank you all so much um, for putting that together. It was uh, it's really interesting and useful to, you know, not just think about the results of the model, but also um, the skill of the <laughs> the skill of the models, which is not a term that I skill assessment's not something I personally think about very often. Um, but I also really appreciated you using some examples and uh, you know the harmful algal balloon stuff, as you know, is a huge concern for a lot of folks on the coast, and uh, as you pointed out, affects you know not just our fisheries but the state managed fisheries and marine mammals and so so that was a great example and then the counter example of the ocean acidification over the long term again like last time all very depressing and and sad but um useful to know that you guys are you know thinking carefully about how to how to figure all this out and then the only sort of start off question I wanted to have, and then I'll turn it over to Deb Wilson Vandenberg of California, who's our rapporteur for this session, was um, uh, did you, so the harmful algal blooms, and I, this is a, a small question, but the, the examples were off the northern coast. Did you focus on the northern coast because you work for the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, or is this less of an issue for the southern coast? I just don't know. And are there similar, um, prediction efforts for the southern end of the of the west coast. Yeah, that's a really good question. This is Vera. Yes, we're focused more in the Pacific Northwest. There are slightly different drivers in the south, and the Scoos folks, in particular, Clarissa Anderson has a really nice forecast model that's based on ocean chlorophyll and transport, et cetera, that works well for that part of the coastline. We haven't specifically tested that out here, but because of our, uh, let's just say satellite is less available, satellite data are less available up here, it's, it's going to have limitations. So yes, just in summary, the Pacific Northwest and the California forecasts are, are quite different right now, and they're likely going to stay different because of our because of the availability of satellite data in the Northwest. Thank you, Vera. Go ahead, Deb. Sorry, I guess it works better if I'm not on mute. Um, I know last time we asked if the work group had questions themselves to start with. Did you want to start with that? I have a couple questions, but would happily defer to my colleagues on the work group first. So how would you like to proceed? Well, why don't you go ahead and then we'll uh, let other folks on the work group ask and then members of the public should they be interested. Great. Um, I had several, but I think the first one I wanted to start with was towards the end of the webinar. I think, um, Isaac, this was part of your section about the IEA work and looking at the economic drivers. And one of the questions I had was based on the information you showed in some of the different figures, uh, it, it looked like Dungeness, I had two questions. One was it looked like Dungeness crab was such a large driver that I was curious what some of those figures or implications would have looked like if you set Dungeness crab aside to look at some of the impacts on other fisheries and groups. And the other was it was hard to imagine overall when you're thinking about economic impacts you may, well, you may have these impacts from ocean acidification. Obviously, you're having other um, drivers affecting the system. Like I'm thinking of highly migratory species moving in more to perhaps some of those northern ports and offsetting some of that financial loss. So I was just wondering if the model accounts for that or how it does. Sure, yes. Uh, this is Isaac Kaplan. So, um, yes, if, if you set I think I'm still, uh, see if I'm still driving the slides. Uh, am I driving the slides? 
Yes. Yes? Okay, great. So um, since I have the slides, I can use those. Uh, so if we sort of set Dungeon S Crab aside, um, this slide, this figure is relevant, um, and I can, I can send you the paper if you uh, remind me in an email. Um, but we see basically um, Dungeon S Crab is, has a very high value, and also, um, uh, so let's see if I can. So the open circle on the right, which is orange, the open uh, circle is the Dungeon S Crab impact. And so that's uh, quite an important fishery economically, and also it suffers, as you can see from its position on the y-axis, a relatively uh, sort of a moderate uh, impact due to ocean acidification in these projections. Um, but some of, from the sort of uh, the, the blue figures in particular, the blue circles, you can see there are also impacts on the ground fish fishery, um, but likely to be what we think from these projections, we expect less of a, a food web effect, an indirect effect on the hake fishery and the CPS. And so, uh, you know, your question about setting Dungeon S aside, I think um, that what you would focus on next would be potential impacts on ground fish and in particular, some of the flatfish species that's uh, detailed in this paper. Um, the, the other question about um, other drivers and in particular, for instance, um, changes in temperature and uh, changes in, in migration and dis spatial distribution. Um, those are things that we uh, are certainly next steps for this work. We did not tackle those. And actually, we, we uh, in, a, in a fairly detailed way, we explicitly removed those effects from, from this publication and from this work. Um, but I, I did want to point out that those sorts of distribution shifts, um, including for highly migratory species, are something that you could probably talk about in the next webinar um, with uh, Jim Thorson and colleagues. I think that webinar should address that specifically. Um, and then in terms of the, not just the movement of species, but also the movement of fishermen, that was not addressed in the work I presented. But again, that's, um, that's a major focus of a new grant that um, uh, Dan Holland and Josh Abbott and Kate Richardson are working on. And I think uh, Dan and Lisa Pfeiffer will present on that. Uh, in a subsequent webinar. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for adding that in at the end. That's another interesting aspect of it, too, is um, thinking of, from the fisherman perspective and the community what actually is going to happen next. Um, looking to see what I have another question um, that had to do with uh, I don't know if you can answer this, um, I, and I think I don't think that it was you that presented this, but Relative to the information on domoic acid and the figure at the towards the beginning and that showed all the different species groups and what the impacts were, I noticed in that that at least as mortalities went, it appeared that was pretty much restricted to sea lions. Is that a result of the fact that they were the ones that tended to be washing up on the beaches, or is it that it tends to be a less lethal effect? for other species? I, I do believe it's because the sea lions are close to shore and they're feeding relatively close to shore. Also, they are feeding on the anchovy and sardine, which are just loaded with toxin. Um, it may be that some of the other mammals, the effects are diluted because that's not a primary food. But I know that, and, and also the Marine Mammal Center in California receives numerous sea lions, and it's less likely that they're going to be able to do uh, treatment of a, a larger mammal. Great. Thank you for that. I think um, I'll hold my other questions and uh, allow my colleagues on the work group to go ahead um, with any questions they have. Anybody? Is it Richard? Uh, Richard Scully has his hand up, and and you're unmuted, Richard. If you want to ask a question or make a comment. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Hello. we can. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I I was was kind of I'm I'm sort of a salmon biologist, and I never really even. I think I heard salmon come up during 
uh, during the presentation and, and a lot of ground fish and especially dungeon nest crab and 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 yet uh, over the over the recent years uh, starting with the blob and all the dominoes that rolled because of that salmon numbers are, are quite down and uh, so is there is there some impact uh, that I'm that we're not talking about here or missing or or what uh, um, I mean I, I heard you say that uh, the the sardines didn't you know the, the coast pelagic species didn't suffer too much and I don't know if they're the a primary food source for um, salmon but um, what do you have any any thoughts or or about what has how how the change in pH and temperature has affected affected salmon? Uh, th this is Isaac Kaplan. I can I can make a couple comments. Um, uh, so yes, maybe it's too bad that um, none of these forecasting efforts right now really focus on salmon. Um, there are some efforts. That I wanted to point you to that you may be aware of. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, some of the testing work that uh, Brian Burke and others are uh, are working on, looking at salmon survival. Um, certainly, Bill Peterson um, uh, initiated that work, and and um, I think that's ongoing. Um, and that, so that's more the sort of uh, seasonal or or a couple year projections, I believe. Uh, you may be more familiar with that. Um, in terms of the long-term climate impacts, uh, there's a, a really nice uh, analysis by Lisa Crozier and colleagues, which is the uh, climate vulnerability assessment, which for our region has been focused specifically on on salmon, which is sort of a new a new thing for this, which started as a national effort. And so, um, so in terms of the very long-term projections and thinking about at least qualitative risk to particular salmon stocks, I think that's uh, uh, Lisa Crozier is a good a good person to follow up with, um, particularly with the ecosystem work group. And um, I I also I guess I wanted to mention that um, as as probably all of you know, there's a upcoming council presentation uh, by the IEA team which uh, always has a bit more salmon focus than we did today. But uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. I might want to comment more. Yeah, this is Mike. Um, so it is worth pointing out that um, these were examples. And uh, if, for something like seasonal forecasting or forecasting a year out or whatever, uh, the nice thing is there's kind of a framework here that can be used for a lot of different species. So if you get these forecasts, you know, high resolution forecasts of the oceanography, um, then people can kind of run with that uh, to look at the impacts on the species of interest to them. Um, you know, for something like salmon, at least on the, the ocean part of the life cycle, the warm water has been associated with changes in the food web, changes in the zooplankton community um, to from kind of like the, the fatty nutritious zooplankton to the, the skinny less nutritious and changes in predator distributions as well so that the, the warm water has been associated with lower survival for salmon and none of that has been explicitly um, shown here but if you have a seasonal forecast for ocean temperatures that have some skill then certainly uh, it's reasonable to think that that those could be applied to salmon and other species This is Samantha. Can I just add one thing to that? So I'm the fourth panelist who hasn't, you guys haven't heard my voice yet, but um, I, I just wanted to add in terms of the salmon, um, I, you know, there are uh, papers out there, as I'm sure as a biologist you've, you know, heard of in terms of impacts of OA and other climate change on, on salmon, but my understanding is that, um, you know, most of those are, are indirect, right? And, and so as a first Pass. A lot of these efforts have focused on more of the sort of direct impact, you know, um, uh, pathways between the ocean conditions and um, the sort of example, you know, species of interest, right? Um, but I do think that the indirect is is very interesting, you know, and one that we can pursue in some of the ways that um, Mike alluded to a second ago. Thank you. Oh. 
if you're a member of another council advisory body or the public and you want to ask some questions, please start uh, raising your hands so that Kit can manage the uh, the questions. And you raise your hand with that little little gray hand icon on the um, the um, pro the uh, controls for the GoTo webinar. Pardon me for jumping in, but I just thought we'd get that going. Is there anyone else from the work group who has a question? Hey, I'm honest with Corey, if you can hear me. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I guess I got a couple questions. One, one of curiosity. I'm wondering maybe for Samantha or Mike or all of you, um, when you make predictions that you, you were talking about uh, the skill of the various, like like predicting sea surface temperature in August back in January and not being very um, skilled there. Do you all go back and, and try to figure out why the prediction went wrong? Or are you able to, to, like, to see why um, the model was off or is it more of a head scratching type of thing? Um, so yeah, I'm kind of curious how much effort you spent on like what, why, why did my prediction go wrong here? Yeah, um, yeah, the mechanisms sort of that generate good or bad predictions are really important to understand um, because a lot of the skill assessment that we, well, the skill assessment we can do is looking at how well forecasts from the past did, obviously, and when you're going forward, um, you want to know when you can rely on the forecasts. So, um, yeah, you can do a certain amount of, I think it's, easier to look at why you did get skill than why you didn't get skill. Um, but there's there's some ability to do both. Uh, one of the main ways you can do it is by looking at how different pieces of the climate system interact in a model versus the model that you're using for your forecast versus the observations that you have. Um, so for example, you might find that in a model, the sea surface temperature is being really strongly driven by, uh, I don't know, changes in cloud cover. And whereas in, in reality, it's being more strongly driven by changes in the wind. So it could be that there are mechanisms wrong in the model, or it could be that there's just whatever is driving sea surface temperature is or isn't predictable um, in the model. So that the example I showed was that we were able to find out that you know a lot of the predictability we got was associated with strong, you know, moderate to strong El Nino and La Nina events. Um, so there are these big signals that are more predictable. Whereas when years when there isn't that big climate signal, you know, the persistence piece is still there, but above that, um, there's there's not as much. So at least in terms of uh, the sort of broad scale of the West Coast, that's what I've seen, is that it's largely associated with um, with persistence plus ENSO variability. Um, and those kind of analyses are really important because then you can say, you can provide a forecast, but you can also say, you know, there's an El Nino happening right now, so we have more confidence in this forecast than we would if there wasn't one happening. This is Samantha. I just want to add to that. Mike, were you done? Sorry, I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, we kind of look at at a skill assessment in two different ways with JScope. We we look at it in terms of um, the you know predictability metrics that were presented here and that Mike was just talking about. Um, but then we also do uh, something called model performance, where we um, actually show, and, and Mike showed one of the slides for that, where we compare against what, what actually happened with the observations, right? And by comparing to different types of observations with different, um, for different variables, we can kind of get an idea of what you're talking about, you know, like what, of a mechanism of, that might be there, um, and think about ways of improving it. So one example I could give you is, um, um, and and I guess to just clarify one thing about what Mike was saying in terms of the large scale predictability analysis he presented, that was all um, focused on sea surface temperature, which is, you know, really important. But there are other variables out there, you know, that have that, you know, are subject to different predictability mechanisms that we're investigating and are not as well understood as sea surface temperature is. Um, and so, you know, for one example is that, you know, for JScope with a model formulation, we don't have 
access no one has made yet. Um, hydrological forecast of like what the Columbia River is going to do um, on a, on seasonal time scales. Um, we um, are you know looking for collaborators to work with and and partner with um, as that's not a skill set that's in our our wheelhouse right now. Um, but uh, so we rely on a climatology of the river flow. Um, and so you know there's times when that's not so when that doesn't do well, right in the forecast, and so we can point to, oh well, well we should we should try and build on what we've been doing, you know, and, and add in a, a hydrological forecast as well to see if that would improve certain things at the surface, right? Um, uh, certain certain variables that are are important, you know, um, that the river chemistry, for example, or the river physics are important for um, at, in the surface, right? So I guess that's one example, but yes, we're we're constantly trying to improve and think about ways of making the forecast better. Okay, any other? Any, oh, go ahead, Deb. Sorry, Vaughn. I, I was probably going to say the same thing as you. I was trying to see if we had any other work group members that had questions. Or if anyone wants to talk about ocean conditions that matter most for you. Uh, Richard, uh, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question that is not about salmon. Um, I'm curious about the, the, um, uh, with the domoic acid and the, the, therefore the hazardous algal blooms plus declining pH, perhaps causing um, poor shell formation. I'm I'm assuming. Uh, you know, which one of these two factors is the most important in the long-term uh, trend in Dungeness crab? Do you, do you expect to see a, a continuous downward trend of one form or another due to um, uh, warming and or um, pH uh, reduction? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I can tell you what I know. Um, it's even thought that maybe ocean and domoic acid act in synergy. So in years when pH is lower, more domoic acid might be produced. On the positive side, what I can say, and this is what I heard, was in 2015, after the bloom had dissipated, because there was basically less fishing of crab, that it was a banner crab year. So I think there are pros and cons of at least the harmful algal bloom. As far as ocean acidic, acidity, I would think that you know that's going to affect the little larvae and their survival, and it's you know not a good scenario. However, the ocean is dynamic, so they're not going to be sitting in these very low pH waters for you know sustained periods of time. Um, so it's a complex question, and this bottom line is we don't have a really clear answer for you right now, but it's a subject of research. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to the 90-minute mark. Uh, I don't mean to rush anyone off, but... Um, if you have any more questions, then please speak up or raise your electronic hand. Uh, this is Corey again, if no one else is going to go. Um, I got a, a, a tough one for Isaac, maybe. I try to deflect us with a question of his own, but Isaac, on, um, on your, your IOPAC map got me thinking that that's kind of one thing we'd one idea that's been put out there for the next step in this initiative is to take the climate change vulnerability assessment and, and connect it to a socio a social economic type vulnerability analysis and and your map is yeah. probably what a lot of a lot of people would like to see so how do we do that how do we how do we do what you did with that um with with jerry and iopac um and, and that vulnerability assessment do you have any have you thought about that Sure. So I've certainly thought about it, um, and I guess uh, we've we've sort of done it. So we have a template for how to go about um, that sort of uh, 
operation. Um, and so, yeah, just to recap, basically, the, the details of what we did there are to uh, go from port level revenue uh, and then feed those into an input output econ model, which has already been um, applied for various fishery council purposes. But uh, apply that, basically use that model to translate into broader economic impact and uh, uh, also jobs. And so it's it's quite a powerful approach. It's also quite limited in that we know people are smart and they move around. Um, and so um, it's sort of reasonable to use those projections for maybe 10-year projections or 15-year projections, but certainly longer than that, um, and perhaps even sh on shorter time frames than that, people will adapt and they will um, sort of deal intelligently with with uh, shifts. So, um, you know, I guess the short answer to your question is, I think that's a good stopgap measure. It's something we have on the shelf right now. Uh, we actually talked about it in a meeting two weeks ago, <laughs> the two of us. <laughs> um, I think it's a, a good stopgap measure, but we probably need to think intelligently about uh, scenarios for scenarios and fishermen behavior and really what the long-term response of fishing communities will be as they as they shift around and deal with these changes that uh, global change is throwing at them. Uh, I'm glad to delve into it more if you have more questions. So, uh, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. oh, sorry, Corey. I wanted to jump in. No, please go a, ahead. A thought or question, and um, you know, folks on the line who are involved in the coastal pelagic species. Um, fisheries or management or science, please um, jump in if I'm getting this wrong. But I am curious, I don't know what ocean conditions matter most for uh, the sardines, anchovies, uh, market squid. And I'm curious to know if that's a focus for any of our work. I realize that's a broad question. Sure. So this is Isaac Kaplan again. Um, just wanted to mention um, that the the JScope work that uh, Sam Sudlecki has led, we sort of spun off some work there looking at ocean habitat for sardine. And so in particular, from that work, it looked like uh, temperature and salinity was particularly important for sardine habitat occupancy in the north. Um, and uh, of course, that's confounded by things like shrinking stock sizes um, in in the recent past. Um, but we have we have developed that there, and I think that that sort of spatial mapping and distribution mapping will be part of um, the physics to fisheries project. And um, certainly, there's a lot of potential there, given what we know about coastal pelagic species and highly migratory species and their habitat usage. That sounds great. I was just thinking that would be you know perfect for the odd question of what what is pelagic essential fish habitat yes and a lot of the the ecocast work that mike mentioned um, also focuses on that pelagic habitat uh, question yeah we haven't um ecocast hasn't looked at uh, the sort of forage species specifically, but in these in these climate projections, we will be looking at sardine. Great, thank you everyone. Kit, does anyone else have their hands up? I don't see any hand raised. Yeah. Okay, so one last call for questions. Hello. Just, just, just. Go ahead, Richard. I just a quick question. I recall on one of your um, graphs, you, you showed the pH. Um, I seem seems like it had changed from uh, around eight and moving down towards seven. I can't remember what the different years those were. Maybe one was predicting way out into the future, but. Uh, I guess I was kind of surprised to see that range. I mean, seven is sort of considered to be neutral. At what at what pH level are um, 
shell uh, forming organisms affected by uh, lower pH is seven is seven a level that that uh, uh, is a problem. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll let I'll let uh, Sam Sam take most of that question, but uh, I think that the slide was mine. This is Isaac, um, and so one of the slides there was from a global model showing that the and in summertime pH uh, from about 8.1 to 7.8. Um, and again, that, that's on a log scale, so it's actually a, a, a big impact in terms of ocean acidification, even though it's a relatively small number. Sort of too bad that that's on a log scale. Um, but that is, a, according to the literature review and the interpretation that um, Shallon Bush and Paul McElhaney provided for that project, um, the lab studies suggest that that does have a large impact on uh, survival, in particular, of some of the shelled species, um, but I, I should let uh, perhaps others on the call delve into the biological impacts a bit more. Um, I can add to that, Isaac. Yeah, the, um, so in it depends on where you are, um, but if for pH, um, but if you're, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, but um, if around the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in the California current system, or a large area of it anyway, um, a pH value of about 7.75 is around where the, what we call the saturation state for aragonite saturation um, begins to get undersaturated. And so that's like a physical chemistry definition, a threshold of where it becomes energetically unfavorable for organisms to precipitate a calcium carbonate or um, shell made out of aragonite, which is a particular mineral of. So um, I guess that that's a technical answer to yes, that seven does matter um, for them. It depends on, um, you know, but different, that's just the physical chemistry, the biology on top of that. There's been work that's shown that some organisms uh, actually feel the, thresh, the threshold before the physical chemistry threshold um, because it starts to affect the, their energetics prior to that. Um, and it's, it has been shown that that particular result has been shown in, in uh, juveniles to be more important. So, um, and then I, just anecdotal, uh, not anecdotally, but from observations, we already experience in, in, in the California current system conditions that are um, in, uh, undersaturated um, pretty, like, pretty regularly now over the summer. Thank you. Okay, well, with that happy thought, uh, <laughs> let, let's conclude. And um, Kit, would you, before we go, would you remind us of the date of the next webinar, please? Oh, I'm looking at it here. Pardon me. It's Thursday, February 22nd. And again, it'll be at 1.30. And, and Yvonne? Before we go, I wanted to thank our speakers for giving us some questions. I thought they were very thoughtful, insightful questions for us to get, keep in mind as we move through this. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to educate us and taking the time to put together such a thorough presentation. We really appreciate it. Yes, this is Kit. I'll just join in the thanks from uh, Yvonne. And uh, I guess that wraps up this webinar. So uh, we'll be signing off here. And uh, thanks all for participating. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.